Uh, hi everyone, welcome to Bold Conjectures with Paras Chopra. Today I'm with Robin Hanson, who is an associate professor of economics at George Mason University and a research associate at the Future of Humanity Institute at Oxford University. He's interested in ideas that shift the ground beneath you. For example, he's interested in whether you can trade ideas like stocks. Uh, he's interested in prediction markets or uh, what would be the impact of brain emulations on economy. Let's just say that Robin is interested in more topics that can be listed. Uh, personally, I'm a fan of his book, uh, The Elephant in the Brain. Uh, it had a major impact on how I view about the world. It talks about uh, how signaling is prevalent in everything we do. Uh, it's a fascinating book. I'll highly recommend uh, you grab a copy of it. But that book is not what we are here to talk uh, uh, about today. Today, we are here to talk about aliens and uh, what can a mathematical model tell us about their existence. So welcome, Robin. Thanks for having me. Here I am. <laughs> Hello. Fantastic. So you're interested in so many things uh, from prediction markets to simulated intelligences to brain emulations. What specifically made you interested in aliens? Well, it's just a big topic. <laughs> So I love big, important topics, and I thought quite a bit about it a little over 20 years ago when I uh, thought about something called the Great Filter. And I realized recently that uh, something ne near that had been neglected, and that was an opening for me to uh, make progress. So I got back into it. Right. So on the topic of uh, the Great Filter, many people are familiar with Fermi paradox, uh, which points to the dissonance uh, in the vastness of the space and the fact that we've not uh, observed any aliens. So before we come to the topic of grabby aliens, which is the paper you wrote about, can you talk about Fermi paradox and uh, specifically its relation to the great filter as you characterize it? Right. So, so the, the key idea is that we at the moment are clearly not very visible from very far away, but we plan or hope in a relatively short time to be much more visible on larger scales of the universe. That is, we're rapidly expanding and rapidly growing as a civilization. And if we just project anything like recent growth rates out into a long-term future, then that suggests we will be much bigger than we are. The technology will advance and improve, and we can already see the glimmerings of being able to make, you know, interstellar colonization, to, uh, to live out in space, to restructure things. And if we did any substantial fraction of what we hope or uh, envision that we might do in the future, then that sort of activity would be visible from a long distance. And then when we look out and we look for that sort of activity, we don't see it. We, we don't see it nearby. We don't see it anywhere from a really long way. And it's just, you might think, well, you know, okay, even one star would be really hard to see from across the universe, but we're not talking one star. <laughs> You know, when we look at our ambitions, we think like, you know, within a million years, we could colonize the whole galaxy and not just colonize in terms of touch and put down a flag. We could go around and reassemble stars and make them into different things, change their spectra, change the, you know, brightness, just change things on a big scale. And so we don't see galaxies like that that are redone from across the scale of the universe. So we're just not seeing anything anywhere that looks like what we might hope or expect to become. <laughs> so that's Fermi's question, where is everybody? <laughs> and uh, I reframed that as a filter that is, okay, well, there's a process that starts with simple dead matter and then goes along, say, to or have the origin of simple life and the more complicated life and eventually intelligence and civilization and then eventually this big expansion. And things start out on that path, but obviously very few of them get to the end. <laughs> The great filter is whatever prevents things from going along that path. And because we see, say, 10 to the 20 <laughs> possible planets out there that haven't made this big visible impact, we might say, well, okay, the filter is a factor of 10 to the 20. Like Very few things that start out on that path go all the way to the end. And that raises the question, well, we're not all the way through the filter yet. We're not big and visible yet. So there could be obstacles in front of us, not just behind us. What fraction of the filter lies ahead? And if this filter is really huge, then even just, you know, a tiny fraction of the filter lying ahead, you know, if it's 10 to the 20, then 10% of it is 10 to the 2, i.e. one a factor of 100, which would say we, we only have a 1% chance of making it, which is, you know, pretty bad news. 
at least if you wanted the option to. So we could talk about whether we actually want to and, and whether we should choose not to, but still we might want the option to. That is probably most of the ways that we would fail to would be because we don't get the choice. We, we can't. Right. So that's the great filter. So it sets up this and it, it creates this uh, contrary expectation that is, if we learn about anything on the path up to this point being easier than we thought, well, that moves our expectation to where the filter is ahead of us. So seeing, say, life on Mars that had a somewhat independent origin would be bad news because it tells us, oh, well, the, the filter behind us isn't as hard. So it must be the filter ahead of us. That's the problem. Right, right. So to summarize, uh, so essentially, um, universe is 13.8 billion years old. And uh, if we talk about intelligent life, your sort of estimation is even though, you know, it will take, uh, say, 5 million years, uh, if this was common, we should have been seeing, uh, say, galaxy-wide uh, transformations from aliens that would have sort of uh, progressed uh, beyond their sort of planet. But we don't see anything of that sort. So is there anything systematic that's preventing civilizations from getting to that point? Uh, that's the great filter. And... Um, I guess what I find fascinating about is uh, when we look at the sky and we don't see anything, uh, it's interesting how it says so much about us and our future. Uh, and that's a counterintuitive point, right? Well, I mean, once you think about it, it's intuitive. But the key point is that thinking about our future and thinking about aliens are kind of thinking about the same subject. <laughs> that is... Uh, you know, if we look out and we're looking for aliens, we're looking for things that would be somewhere along our path, most likely past where we are in order to be visible out there somewhere. And so asking about aliens is asking about where we might go. Right. OK, so building from uh, the uh, great filter, supposedly uh, civilizations uh, that uh, become interstellar, they are sort of incredibly rare. Uh, how does that lead to the whole idea of grabby alien? So what it is and how do you connect that to uh, what should we sort of think? How should we so, sort of think about aliens? So the first piece is the hard steps model. So this is something that I was aware of 20 years ago and I did some math contributions to it. Uh, and it's about our past. It says that um, if you think about a planet like Earth, or achieving something like us, um, basically a bunch of hard things had to happen before a deadline. That is, Earth won't stay hospitable to life forever. And, um, you know, maybe life had to start and then maybe sex had to evolve and multicellularity and intelligence. And each of those steps could have been a very hard step in the sense that it would just take a very long time on average to, to get to the next step. But, um, you know, and plausibly most planets just never reach where we are by the end of the time their window runs out. So we are a rare lucky exception where a planet happened to go through a bunch of steps quickly compared to where they, how fast they would go elsewhere. And the hard step model says that these steps could vary enormously in how difficult they were, but conditional on all the steps finishing by a deadline, we can actually say some interesting things about it, we can say that the, the the time duration between each step would be drawn from roughly the same distribution. <laughs> uh, and therefore, looking at the time durations between steps can tell us about how many steps there are. And when we look at Earth's history, we can use, say, the duration up until the, the first life seemed to have appeared, and then the time that seems remaining from now until life would no longer be possible, we can use those durations to actually estimate how many hard steps there were <laughs> in Earth's history, and it's, say, roughly 4 to 12, somewhere in that range. Okay. And in addition, we can say that the chance when life would appear in, on a planet like Earth, conditional on it eventually appearing, goes as a power law. And it's the power of those number of steps. So if there's, say, were six steps, then the chance of life appearing on Earth would go as the sixth power of time, which would be, you know, emphasizing toward the end of the period. Right. And that power law is a thing I realized recently had been neglected in larger analyses. Okay. So um, we can, say, calculate 
the time when advanced life should appear in the universe by combining this power law on each planet with known astrophysical distributions over when stars and therefore planets are formed, and that peaked about 4 billion years after the Big Bang, plus the distribution of how long stars and planets live, like how many stars there are of each you know, lifetime. And we can put that all together into a calculation of when we would expect advanced life to appear in the history of the universe. That is, you know, a star has to form and has to have a certain length. And then in that length, we have this power law of the chance that advanced life would appear uh, at a particular point during that history. So if we put all that together, um, the key thing is that our star is very short lived compared to most. Yeah. Our star will last about 10 billion years. The average star will last 5 trillion years. That is 500 times longer. And this power law really favors later times. <laughs> so it's not just that a planet that lasts 5 trillion years and lasts 500 times longer has 500 times the chance of having life appear on it than ours does. It's 500 raised to the power <laughs> of 4 to 12, which really rewards or emphasizes the longer lived stars. So overwhelmingly, the chance when life would appear in a universe like ours is on a long lived star much later. We are crazy early compared to that distribution. Now, right. that calculation had one key assumption. It was that the universe will sit and wait, empty and passive, until the planet finally develops advanced life. And that's the assumption we say is plausibly wrong here. Now, you could assume, and some people have tried to, assume that only very short-lived stars like ours could possibly produce advanced life. None of the others could ever, ever do it. And they, that needs to be a very strong restriction and very strict, because otherwise this power law and this long time scales really uh, went what, out. Sorry, what would be the basis of this assumption? Why would one is well, so? So they, they look at things that happened around our star and our planet, and they say, ah, those were absolutely necessary. So there are differences for longer lived stars. For example, longer lived stars have less ultraviolet radiation. They have oh. larger solar flares. The planets okay. may plate tectonics may slow down and stop after a certain time period. Okay. There, there's there are just different differences on these different you know stars have planets that are somewhat different and they have different characteristics and so they say aha well those must be crucial characteristics and you, you must absolutely need the features of the shorter lived stars in order to produce advanced life okay got so you. that that would be a way they hypothesize but that seems to me pretty fragile so the robust assumption is there must be lots of different ways of producing advanced life <laughs> Mm -hmm. Sure, some of them may be favored on shorter lived stars, but there's a lot more longer lived stars and they last a lot longer. Right, right. And so, so taking a, you know, just taking a pause here, I want to make sure I capture what you're saying. Uh, so essentially, the argument is if there are n hard steps towards uh, intelligent life, uh, then uh, you sh one would assume there's a power law, which means much higher chances of intelligent life appearing at the end of uh the system than sort of start of the system and since right. and and yeah. much like more likely on longer lived ones right 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 i mean that's because it they would have been a lot of like i mean significantly more time for those hard steps to sort of play out so your argument is that if uh, we knew nothing else about us humans we should expect ourselves to be around uh, like a star with lifetime of 10 trillion years versus a star of 10 billion years, and yet right. we find ourselves around a star of 10 billion years. So in that sense, we're incredibly sort of, uh, I mean, it's it's like an outlier where overwhelmingly, right. we should have been around a red giant star with 10 trillion years, but uh, right. find ourselves around sun. Exactly. So the key point is when you have a theory and its observation you know, is contradicted very strictly, then something has to be wrong with the theory. The assumptions you made have to be wrong. So one of the assumptions could be that long lived stars could at all create life and advance mm -hmm. life or sustain it. Uh, but the other assumption that seem makes more sense to us is the that the universe would stay empty. And so we'd say this is the clear evidence that they actually are out there right now. <laughs> Right now out there are aliens who are expanding and will, within a billion or two years, fill up the universe. And after that, you can't appear. 
because everything will be taken. Life can only appear and evolve on Earth if Earth is empty and not taken over by advanced aliens. <laughs> If advanced aliens had taken over our planet a billion years ago, they would be they would have taken it apart, rearranged it, done different things to it in ways that would prevent us from doing what we're doing now. Right. It's, so that's the key evidence. They're out there. They are actually out there. There really are aliens out there and they are filling up the universe. And so we want an analysis of that process that gives us more detailed estimates of where they are, what they're doing, when we might meet them, etc. And so this is the 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 rationale of the gravity aliens model it says right. we are really early the best explanation is they're out there they set a deadline they will fill things up soon and that's why we need so a model when, when you when you say they're out there do you mean they're out there uh, i mean i know in the i mean the concept of now itself sort of is on the shaky grounds when we sort of talk about the universe there's no global clock uh, but but do you mean like uh, in a rough sense they they will appear sometime in the future and or do you mean they're like literally so, right now? So um, we can talk about sort of the same time if we talk about time duration since the Big Bang, and so there is a plausible sense in which other things far away we can say now with respect to how long it's been for them and us since for the them. Big Bang. Okay. Um, now, so the, the key gravity aliens model is advanced life appears at some point in space time. It, it appears at a random point in space and it appears at a time according to this power law. And then once it appears, it starts expanding at some speed and then they keep expanding until they meet each other and then everything is full. That's the simple gravity aliens model. So in that model, you can ask, OK, for it, that model has three parameters. There's two parameters of this power law of appearance and one parameter of the speed. That's the entire model. And the key point is we're going to be able to, to estimate each of these parameters from data. Hmm. And one of the datums is we don't see them out there. That's a key piece of data. And it turns out that piece of data is what lets us infer their expansion speed. So we're imagining aliens, say, millions of years more advanced than us, reach some sort of maximum technology, and they're sending out starships to colonize, which land and then start to grow and then send out more, send out more starships. And you might think, well, how fast could that go? You know, there, there could be a competitive process such that they would expand as fast as they could if they were competing with local, you know, rivals. But uh, how fast could that be? <laughs> and that's just free parameter of the model. But once we have this model and we calculate it, we can say, well, as we vary the speed, how many others should any one origin be able to see? So we are now near a potential origin. That is, if we became gravity, that would happen in, say, the next 10 million years, which is a relatively short cosmological time, but plenty of time for us to develop advanced technology. So our or point in space time is a sample from the origins of gravity alien civilizations. And we can ask in the model, well, you know, how many others can they see at their origin? And what's the distribution of that? And we find that if the speed of expansion is low, then each origin can typically see lots of others. But if the speed of expansion is very high, then they can't. And so since we can't, we then include, conclude, okay, the speed of expansion must be high. So to answer your question, they're out there right now, but they're expanding so fast that we can't see them yet. Because okay. <laughs> they're expanding nearly as, you know, within a factor of two or four of the speed of light. So right. uh, if we could see them, they'd be here by now instead of us. Right. Uh, there's this a selection is... effect. We can only be in a place where they can't have gotten here yet and they don't have gotten here yet. That means you probably can't see them yet. Right. I mean, this is a counterintuitive bit. I'll come to that, but I want to make sure again, I understand uh, how do we infer uh, the presence of aliens from not seeing aliens. So your point is that uh, uh, by default, we should observe ourselves. We should expect to observe ourselves around like a very old star. Uh, but since we don't do that, there are possibly two explanations for it. One, maybe life only arises around short-lived stars, uh, which you say is probably not as robust. The second is we don't exist around a long-lived uh, star, which is 
more common in the universe because it's possibly occupied by grabby aliens and they set this sort of a deadline and that's why we find ourselves around like a short lived star that's that's a sort of it's why, it's why we find ourselves so early right now in principle and, we could have be early on a long lived star right uh, but but the key point is we're early and this is explaining why we're so early right and being early means they're out there right now and right. then we ask but why can't we see them and the answer is because they're expanding very fast and you wouldn't if you could see them they'd be here by now okay <laughs> can you maybe go through this once again i think this is somewhat counterintuitive of not seeing uh, any aliens as an evidence of right. they being there and expanding really fast so we can only see things in our backward light cone right that is if you have an image of space time we can't see into the future or even to the side in space time we can only see back because light has a limited speed and so we can only see things within the space time regions where if you know some light had appeared started there it could get to here by now so um but a lot of that backward space time region is excluded in the model because if an agrabi alien civilization had started there it would be here by now <laughs> and so the the volume of that backward light cone that's excluded by this constraint gets bigger as their expansion speed gets bigger and in the limit <laughs> when they expand at the speed of light it's all excluded that is you wouldn't see them until they got right. here because you would never get an early warning now if they exceed at say half the speed of light well then there is a region which uh is still you know possible to see them before they get here but it's small compared to all the region that's excluded uh that is the selection effect is we can't see them if they would be here now instead of us we can only see them if you know we get light from them but their expansion speed is slower and we're we're seeing you know them on the way got it so when we look at uh, when we look at the stars we are actually looking back in time and the fact that uh, we don't see anything uh, is in evidence to the fact that if they existed they would probably be expanding so fast uh, that uh, we wouldn't sort of be observing them right now if you thought it was just impossible say to expand at more than 1/10 of the speed of light that was just physically impossible then you'd have to be saying this disproves your model robin <laughs> that is the model is you know basically the model has three parameters we're going to we can fit each of the parameters to data and the model makes particular predictions and you know about how many you would see for example and about a bunch of other things and so if the model predicts that you don't see things but only if they expand very fast and you say ah but a fast expansion is impossible and you have to say well, okay your model is just wrong it's predicting something that's not what we see and when it, the model says we would see them we would see big huge things the vast majority of them would be much larger than the full moon in the sky okay we're not talking a little tiny thing you need an enormous telescope to see you know at, if we were if they were all expanding at a lower speed then we on a typical origin you know point in space time we would see many of them in the sky and they would be huge and and the key idea is somehow they would change their volumes now we have to admit we don't know exactly how they would change their volumes i mean they're using very advanced technology but the key idea is that they they they're going to do something different than what it started <laughs> when we go out and we farm or we build a city we change what was there before yeah and so you know the, the idea is they are they have there's resources they want to use there's energy sources there's materials they would grab those and start to use them <laughs> and that would somehow change how things look so um you know if for some reason we they are changing things but somehow we're just missing the thing to look for that's the signature of the change then we have predictions in our paper about well you know what you should see how 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 big the spheres in the sky you would see roughly and the distribution of their angular sizes and the borders around them you know so we give you stats on that but most likely we think you would just have already seen them right and and the fact that we don't see anything of that sort you are saying it's an sort of like it points to the fact that if if they are there then the rate of expansion is much much Very faster fast. 
Right. Now, again, you could say, well, isn't it just simpler to believe they're, they aren't even there? <laughs> and we'd say, well, the problem then is explaining why we're so early. <laughs> yeah. I mean, there's no, it seems there's no way out of this. I mean, no simple explanation. Um, uh, but what does your model say in the sense of when should we expect them? I mean, when should we expect to meet them? Well, so let's just be clear about how we're estimating this first from the three parameters for okay. the three data. And so then we can say, you know, the estimates vary with our precision on these parameters. <laughs> so one datum we have is our current date. And we, with that, we can say we assume that we are a random sample from the various origin dates of gravity aliens. <laughs> and that lets us give it, this gives us a distribution over one of the key parameters, the constant in the power law. <laughs> The so constant in the power law sets when things appear and we are at a date. So we get a rough estimate of this constant from our current date. Again, the speed, uh, we get an estimate of that from not seeing anything. And so the fact that we don't see anything sort of limits the speed to be more than say a third of the speed of light, somewhere in there. So, you know, again, a factor of three, roughly uncertainty. And the last thing I said is this power which we get from Earth's history of hard steps, say roughly four to 12 power. So we have a family of models here with three parameters, and each of the three parameters is roughly estimated to say within a factor of three or four. Right. So that means we're not getting precise estimates, we're getting rough estimates because of these uncertainty, these parameters. But you know, we can calculate for each combination of the parameters <laughs> the answer to the question, and then we can give you distributions over the answers to the questions. So in our paper, what we mainly give is distributions to the answers to the questions, which is a good time to mention. All of the things I'm talking about now are presented in a paper published in Astrophysical Journal in the last few months. Astrophysical Journal, according to Google, is the number two journal in math and physics. So this isn't just speculation at some stuff. It's, it's uh, you know solid speculation, if you like. And we're showing the distribution of these parameters. So once you, so this is to help you understand like why I'm giving you rough estimates, right? <laughs> because we have these three parameters, each of which is roughly known, but not exactly known. And hopefully right. in the future we could get to know them better and have more precise estimates. But so one obvious question is, okay, well, when we will we see or meet them? <laughs> and that's say roughly a billion years. We might get lucky and it would be you know, 100 million years, it might get unlucky and it would take 3 billion years perhaps, but around a billion years. And that's of course, if we go out there to meet them, if we wait here for them to come here, it would take twice as long till we met them. Um, another question is, well, like how often do they appear roughly? And it's roughly once per million galaxies. Oh, so that's quite true. That's in some sense, the answer to the rate filter. How often does advanced life appear? once per million galaxies. Now that's pretty rare. Yeah. So there's this famous book called The Rare Earth. And yes, according to this, Earth is quite rare. One per million galaxies, uh, do you have something that, that achieves the gravity alien status and expands out? Um, and, you know, like, like I said, roughly half of the volume of the universe is right now occupied by gravity, advanced gravity aliens. Uh, they are out there changing and doing it. So we're, we're midway through the process of the universe converting from being dead and empty to full of life. We just can't see it because of the selection effect. Right. Uh, you, those are the, so what, what do you mean half of the universe is filled with them and also well, like once every million galaxies they appear? So again, there's three parameters in the model. There's two parameters of an appearance, right? That's a random points right. in space, they just start and they start at a time that's given by this power law, which has a constant and a power. So they appear more rapidly later in time and very rarely earlier in time. So, you know, the, the appearance rate dramatically speeds up uh, as you get farther on in time. And then once they appear, they just expand at their expansion rate and then they expand until they meet each other. And you can go to our website, grabbyaliens.com, and you can see videos of uh, the simulation of this sort of process. And that's the model. So at a typical origin time for a gravity alien species, roughly 
there, it's in the middle of the distribution. So it's at a point in time where half of the other gravialian species appeared before and half right. will appear afterwards. And so at a time when half of them have already appeared and started growing, they have filled up roughly half of the universe. <laughs> roughly half of the volume of the universe has been taken over by them and reconstructed, rearranged to their liking. Right, right. Um, so I was, uh, um, I'm, I'm curious, uh, uh, what observations uh, or evidence will, if, if we find that out, will decrease your confidence in this model? Say tomorrow we discover something new, what will make you revise your beliefs significantly? Well, certainly if we could show in more detail that advanced life was just not possible on longer lived stars or planets around longer lived stars, right? So we're going to learn more over the over time about the origin of life and the conditions necessary for life to uh, arise and evolve. And we could learn that, in fact, you know, this just doesn't work around longer lived stars. Uh, that would be that would say, well, I guess it has to be the shorter lived stars, which then I guess raises the possibility that we are early for some other reason. It doesn't destroy the, the theory. It just raises an alternative theory that makes becomes more plausible. We'll also be able to learn about the actual physical process of interstellar movement and growth. So, um, you know, the, the, the scenario is that a advanced grabby civilization they send out a starship. They make a starship and they launch it and they accelerate it. And then it goes to another place and it lands. And then it starts to grow there like a seed on soil. And it grows enough that it can launch another starship and another starship heads on out. And that process, if you think about all the different ways to do it, has some maximum speed of, of movement. And eventually we will understand the details of maximal growth and maximum speed enough to figure out what that maximal colonization speed is. And if that maximal colonization speed were to say 1% of the speed of light, then I'd have to say, well, with that constraint, my model clearly predicts they'd be visible in the sky. And so then you might try to save it by saying, ah, but we're not looking at the right thing in the sky, but still it would be bad news. Right, right. What, what about, I mean, one of the basic assumptions is also that uh, they would be the sort of, they would be drive to expand. I'm just curious, uh, what if like maybe after a certain point, uh, civilizations get engulfed in civil conflicts and uh, maybe they, they just so, don't want to right. expand. So, um, you know, the most interesting actionable part of this model from our point of view is the idea that we have not yet passed the entire filter here. <laughs> we are not yet a grabby alien civilization. Yeah. So there is some chance we will become one. And then there will be in some sense, a choice that is we along the way can influence that chance. And we can ask ourselves, do we want to now, the basic grabby aliens model only requires that some small fraction do. And it could be as small as one in a million. <laughs> So it doesn't require that all of them by any means do. Yeah. And by a civilization expanding, it doesn't re even require most of that civilization to approve or support. The key idea is if a civilization expands across a wide enough spatial scope and area, then if any one small part of that civilization decides to expand into the universe, then there's not that much the rest of them can do to stop it. Mm. So the key question is, you know, what's the chance that eventually some part of our descendants will be far enough away from the others and powerful enough that they by themselves could choose to expand in the universe without anyone else's permission or approval. Right. So and at that point there there's, you know, it's pretty hard to stop. So but before that point. <laughs> you know, it's not at all guaranteed to reach that point, right? And so again, it could be only one in a million. So one of the things we do in our recent astrophysical journal paper is we take this key ratio of, you know, the, the fraction of things that reach our level that eventually become grabby. And we use that ratio to talk about the chances for SETI, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. Right. That is 
The grabby aliens model just basically tells us the density of the grabby aliens, but then there's non-grabby aliens out there. And so the ratio of non-grabby aliens to grabby is this ratio. And as that ratio gets larger, then the nearest non-grabby aliens to us get closer. There's more of them. Yeah. And so we can ask how high does that ratio need to be, say, for there to be one other grabby alien civilization in our galaxy at the moment that's active at the moment, or one ever that's ever been in our galaxy, or one ever one other that's somewhere on our backwards light cone, et cetera. And it turns out you need this ratio to be really high, say a million, for there to be one active in the galaxy right now. And so that's pretty bad news for SETI because it says that. Um, you know, at the moment, SETI would have trouble finding thousands of other civilizations in our galaxy at the moment, at least if they were small and not very noisy or, or big. And so this says, well, there's probably much less than one. So uh, now I, I do think there's this the, the key question then is, OK, there's this low chance, perhaps, that we become grabby. What's the most likely thing to knock us off that path? And what are the key questions about whether we want it, whether we want to? Mm -hmm. And so I've given that a lot of thought, and uh, that doesn't appear in the Astrophysical Journal paper. But one key issue is what level or strength of world governance will we have? And to what extent will people not want to give it up in order to allow expansion? So. A key fact about world history is that until recently, we have not had much in the way of world governance. Yeah. So on the larger scales, the world has just been competing. That is, we compete by war, we compete in business, we compete for more genetic progeny. The world has been a world of competition, and that's been true for bi biological organisms for, for billions of years. And we see many destructive consequences of competition on the larger scales. And we like the idea of sort of getting together on the larger scales and deciding things together and fixing our global problems together without the destructive consequences of competition. And in the last half century or so, we've been doing a lot more of that and we like it. So for example, a lot of people are concerned about global warming and they want us to have stronger global governance to prevent global warming. <laughs> and it, the, you know, the lack of that is one of the major obstacles. And for a great many other problems in the world, people lament that we don't coordinate better to solve them. And they would like us to have stronger global coordination to solve them. And if we manage to produce stronger global coordination over the next coming centuries, we will have many big problems we can point to that we did somewhat solve with those global institutions. Say war, we could, have do a, we could prevent a lot more war, and we probably will prevent a lot more war with stronger global governance. We will deal with global warming. We will promote innovation. We may deal with inequality and transfers, environmental damages. There's just all sorts of global problems that global governance will be able to deal with and solve. So just like for the same reason that people like their national governments, in part because their national governments can actually take credit for solving many national problems, people will like the idea of global governance. And the key point is, at some point, if you allow interstellar colonization, if you allow parts of us to leave and go off in some direction at a fast speed, then the era of global or civilization-wide coordination is over. Um, no more. We, they would be, we would fragment again into many competing parts. And that could really bother people. They really might think that's just not okay. They just do not approve of that. They like having the entire civilization under a single central governance and coordination. And so there would be resistance to allowing uh, independent expansion out into the universe on that basis. Now, the question is like, OK, but could that last for 10 million years? <laughs> could they prevent that happen? Because, you know, it just takes one failure at one point to, to yeah. be failure, right? One set of colonists sneak off in one direction uh, far enough away and start growing before you can find out and do anything about it, then it's over. So you might say, well, what's the chance? 
that you could keep that going for 10 million years. So I think for that, you have to ask, you have to imagining some sort of scenario of destruction or decay. That is, imagine our descendants producing, say, a solar system wide civilization with a solar system wide governance, but for some reasons, that civilization is decaying or at risk of, of total destruction. So you could imagine a risk of suicide. Maybe they just get in the mood and all kill themselves or some system wide destruction that they aren't protected against because they're all only in one system or decay, I think is the most plausible thing or rot that is until now in history, until recently, firms and nations and communities can go wrong in a whole bunch of ways. And the main fix has been competition from others. Yeah. And once we have a global worldwide governance, that stops that fix. It stops that process of competition fixing the collective problems we fall into. And those collective problems are actually pretty severe and common. And we could go into that, the evidence for that, if you like. But, um, you know, the, the entire system wide failures, there's a lot of ways things can go wrong. And again, there won't be competition to fix that. And there's also this like process we've seen of rot in software where just large, complicated systems just typically go wrong in a, in a particular way, which is typically in software only fixed by throwing it away and starting all over again. And in history, we have seen a very consistent rise and fall of empires and civilizations. Right. Uh, which what? is very striking and disturbing. And this yeah. suggests that we are now all one big civilization and we may well, after a rise, fall. Yeah, but, but and it, it seems, uh, I mean, uh, both life and culture have been somewhat robust also to a uh, lot of perturbations in history. I mean, uh, I mean to, to me, it seems competition is such an ingrained uh, uh, such a, such an ingrained factor in life right from the first cell to species but we, and so we on we have it, been stopping competition in the last 50 years so i think it's important to see how much in fact global coordination we actually have I, I think people don't notice it so people are focused on government and they notice that well okay we have sort of a world government but it's pretty weak and most of our global governance institutions are on the surface weak and sort of voluntarily participation, but we actually have pretty strong global mob. <laughs> we have a world mob. So through most of history, most human communities had a lot of gossip and talk and consensus forming where they decide who are the elites and the elites decide what they all agree on. And that consensus forming process by gossip and status is a very strong, robust process in human history. And it's one of the ways that societies go wrong <laughs> when their elites all agree on something that's wrong. <laughs> uh, and the main fix on that in history is, again, if, if say, Japan's elites all go wrong and go, decide to be decadent or something, then some other society eventually beats them out and that's the fix. But today we have a world community of elites who gossip, who then all decide things together. And if you look at many areas of policy, government policy, they are remarkably common and consistent around the world because the elites talk and they all agree on what the best thing to do. We saw that very dramatically with COVID. Yeah. <laughs> there are a lot yeah. of sort of deviant policies on COVID that some of us wish somebody somewhere would try, but nobody ever tried. And if you look at say nuclear energy or electromagnetic spectrum, uh, medical ethics, in a wide range of these areas, there's just very strong global consensus on what the rules should be, and they are pretty much implemented the same everywhere. And so there is not experimental variation on these things, right. and there's not deviation. We are now subject to and following the inclinations of the world mob. Right. And your, your and concern is that uh, this sort of like a world order or world consensus could prevent us from becoming grabby and actually expanding. Well, uh, you know, later on, it may agree that we shouldn't ex allow expansion <laughs> and then enforce that agreement everywhere, even without a central necessarily world government. But in addition, those sorts of agreements on all the other policies are ways in which the world together could just decay and decline mm. because right. we are no longer fixing the key problems that previous society had when each society went wrong. Right. So, I mean, think, of, think about firms, right? 
We all know that large old firms are pretty stuck in their ways and often pretty inefficient. And the main fix is lots of small new firms come up and displace them. Imagine we didn't allow new firms. We only just had old firms and we had to somehow reform these old firms. Well, our economies would just grow more slowly and they would have a lot more obstacles to growth because we weren't allowing new firms to replace the old ones. Right. Well, okay. this is the plausible scenario the world actually faces if we have enough global consensus on what everybody should be doing and we enforce that, then we again no longer have the variety and innovation of new things displacing old things. Right. Okay. So um, coming back to uh, the point you were making um, about SETI project, uh, uh, a lot of people know about SETI uh, where they're searching for extraterrestrial intelligence, but they've not found anything as of now. Um, so what's your view on that? I mean, is that a misguided effort? Do you have an advice for them? Well, the, the main prediction here is they won't find anything. Now, it's pretty cheap and they might find other things in the process. So I'm not opposed to people spending current levels of, of budget on looking for things. Uh, but I just don't think we should be optimistic. <laughs> Most likely you won't find anything. Uh, and you should realize that there's a theory that predicts that. And uh, maybe think about that. So, I, I mean... I think at the beginning, you sort of posed me as someone who's has a lot of ideas and speculations and, you know, big contrary offers. But I, I am offering this as not just a crazy idea that, hey, it might be true, but I'm saying our best data supports this particular account. This isn't the alternative account that should be considered compared to something else. This should be the standard account. Uh, right. That is. We are early. Our best story about why we are early is that they are out there. If we have a simple three parameter model of where they are in space time, we can fit each of the parameters to data. And that gives us predictions about where they are in space time. And these are those predictions. So this is our best story about what's going on with aliens. Now, this is mainly about one kind of alien, the grabby kind, the most interesting kind. And then we can ask about you know, and other aliens like, say, us. And then we have this key ratio that the data we have doesn't pin down this ratio. Uh, but we can say either that ratio is very low, in which case our future chances are very good, or the ratio is very high, in which case our future chances are very bad. And only in the case where the ratio is very high do we have much of a chance of SETI finding much. So and then SETI finding something is going to be bad news for our future. The, the closer that you find an alien out there, the um, more likely that we just can't get there from here. Right. Uh, you also, in one of your posts, you mentioned that, uh, I guess you're making a related point, if we find an alien civilization, uh, which is not really sort of big and evident, but maybe on UFOs you talked about, we should be very worried uh, if we sort of find UFOs, why is that so? Well, so the one big change in the model I gave you, or at least a an important modification, is to consider the possibility of panspermia. So panspermia would be life didn't start on Earth. Life started on some other planet, call it Eden, and then life was transferred to Earth. So the most likely point in time for life to be transferred to Earth under that scenario would be in the stellar nursery where Earth and the Sun were formed together with thousands of other stars at the same time. And so those stars were all very close to each other and those planets close to each other with lots of rocks flying back and forth between them. So if life from another planet seeded Earth in the stellar nursery, most likely it would also have seeded other planets in the nursery because they were all born in the same place and time, all close together. And so under the panspermia theory, which isn't at all crazy, it's not obvious, but it's not crazy, um, there would be this limited number of other planets out there who were born at the same time and place as the Earth, who are also trying to go along the path toward advanced life. And then plausibly one of them could have reached our level before us. Mm -hmm. Okay, now, 
if they had quickly become grabby aliens, then they would have prevented us from existing. So most likely, if they had arrived at our level before us, they would be, you know, hundreds, tens of millions of years ago, at least. And right. in that time period, they could have easily taken over the galaxy. So and the galaxy doesn't look taken over. <laughs> so we can conclude that if there were panspermia siblings who matured before us, they chose not to expand into the galaxy and to take things over. So plausibly, they would be one of these civilizations that decided they liked their world government more than they wanted expansion and they wanted to keep their civilization coherent. And they would then realize that if they had siblings and they allowed those siblings to go out and expand, that would prevent, that would overturn their, their nice situation of having a, a single coherent civilization. And so they would have needed to send somebody to each of their siblings to wait until they matured to make try to convince them or ensure that they did not expand into the universe like they had chosen not to do. So that theory predicts aliens around here <laughs> waiting for us. Now, it doesn't predict what we seem to see UFOs doing if they are doing something. And so we need to go a little farther to try to explain that. No, but the very idea of panspermia siblings does predict with a substantial you know, probability that one of them matured before us and a substantial chance that they would not choose to expand, that they would choose to have a limit on their expansion and therefore they would need to come here to enforce that rule on us. And then the one part that if you wanted to postulate UFOs or aliens, you need to add in order to make this theory work is to say why they are hanging at the edge of our vision. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Because look, for the purpose of just coming here and stopping us from expanding, they could either have just shown up in our sky and announced themselves and declared that they are our gods and that we best not disobey them. That was completely possible. They're again, at least 10 million years more advanced than us. That would be completely possible or they could have completely hidden. They could be completely invisible, not at all being seen and waiting for some key moment. Both of those would sound like reasonable strategies, <laughs> but if what we're seeing as UFOs are aliens, then they apparently didn't choose either of those two strategies. So apparently what they chose is to hang out just at the edge of our vision, impressing the heck out of us with their capabilities, but not letting us learn very much about them. Right. So. In order to account for UFOs as aliens, you need a theory of that. Otherwise, you're going to say, no, this is just not a theory that makes sense. Have you have you tried your hand at writing fiction? Uh, I've tried my hand at sketching fiction in the sense of sketching the scenario and characters and conflicts and things like that. I haven't actually like, this, this sounds, uh, I mean, this sounds <laughs> like it could uh, turn out to be really interesting. Uh, Really interesting sort of story. But, but I do have a, I do have a, a, a theory again. So I'm a social scientist trying to explain behaviors. So I do think there is a plausible story about why the aliens, if UFOs were aliens, why they would hang out at the edge of our vision. That is, and it's plausible enough that I put the whole hypothesis at least say a one in a thousand prior. Oh, that's quite that strong is, actually. Or, well, right. So, right. So if you if you think like most murder trials start out with a one in a million prior say, what's the chance that any one person murdered somebody else? That's got to be on average, say one in a million. But you're willing to listen to the murder trial because, hey, evidence is often sufficient to overcome that. Yeah. Well, if you say, are UFOs aliens? First, you have to ask, well, what's the prior? If you if you many people say, well, the prior is so crazy low, that's just a crazy, unlikely hypothesis. They say whatever evidence you have, that can't possibly convince me, which makes sense if you thought your prior was crazy low. Yeah. If I say the prior is one in a thousand, then you have to admit that, OK, that's high enough that if somebody says they're seeing strange stuff, you got to go look at the strange stuff to decide. You can't just say, no, that can't be true. So that's right. basically my stance with respect to the evidence. When I look at it, it looks disturbing and, and, and not easily explained, but I'm not going to pose myself as an expert on that stuff. I can be an expert on the prior. I can say, look, I'm my I study scenarios of the universe and I can tell you which scenarios are how likely and so I can say this scenario where aliens are hanging out in our sky but not in the rest of the universe and they have this goal of getting us not to expand that's not so crazy and the last part of it you would need 
to explain why they're just at the edge of visibility, I would say is they want to sit at the top of our status hierarchy. So, you know, most, you know, advanced social animals have status hierarchies. It's a very robust feature of, of animal groups. And uh, they defer to higher status animals. And the higher status animals are more impressive, typically, in many ways. And that's also even true in human culture. But it's not just human. Lots and lots and lots of social animals have status hierarchies where they defer to the higher status um, versions. So the idea is that the aliens are here just to try to be at the top of our status hierarchy. They have to sort of be here and not there. And they have to not be very threatening. Otherwise, they will see them as part of them and not us. But they're hanging around here, seeming to be part of us, but just much better than us. Well, Eventually, we will go, well, they're, they're the top dog. They're the king. I mean, they're, look look how much better they are than everybody else. I mean, you know, you know, ancient societies, as you know, the king tried to show himself as better than everybody else by a fancy palace and fancy clothes and music and parades and armies, right? You know, and of course, most ancient religions tried to have impressive temples <laughs> to show that their god was, was a great god because they could have a great temple. And, you know, like the UFOs are just here to impress us. And eventually we'll be convinced they exist. And once we are, we'll be pretty damn impressed by them. And we'll also see they haven't been hostile. And we'll say, and we'll be able to figure out their agenda. We'll be able to say, why are they here? Oh, well, they appeared, some, they're a transpermia sibling. They chose not to expand. They're here to stop us from expanding. And we may well just go along with that because that's what the, uh, the high status people do. Sorry, are you saying they could have such advanced technology that uh, we wouldn't even notice they coming and going or absolutely like no physical sure. trace of it? Well, no, no trace that we would see. <laughs> that is, they, they, they would be very easily able to see our level of technology and see what we and be able to figure out what we could see. And then they could just make things we couldn't see. So even at the moment, they could have big things in orbit that are covered with very black paint that we would just would not see. That's just quite fe feasible today with respect to our technology. So they could be watching us very closely from one of these big black things in orbit, and we wouldn't see them at all. We know that there could be such things. You know, basically, we look for such things, say, from other countries putting up in the space. We try to track them when they're launched, because if they're up there in dark, then it's, they're very hard to find. We'd be looking for an emissions or some temperature thing. But if they made them very cold, very dark, the, we, we know we couldn't see them. Right, right. I um, on the same podcast, I also interviewed uh, Anders Sandberg, uh, uh, who wrote, who who wrote on a similar topic, and uh, his thesis is that uh, life on Earth actually sort of intelligent life on Earth actually sort of started pretty late, wherein if if we imagine we only have a billion years uh, before Earth becomes uh, inhabitable. Then it took about 4 billion years uh, for intelligent life to arise. So from that, he essentially estimates that uh, intelligent life should be incredibly rare because we've sort of arrived so late in the game. Otherwise, we should have arrived uh, maybe, you know, maybe 100 millions after the earth was formed or maybe 200. So how, and, and from that, he concludes intelligent life should be practically sort of not existent in universe. So I'm not sure if you've read the paper, but I'm curious what are your sure. views on that? So the, you know, intelligence arriving late on Earth is exactly what we were discussing earlier when I said there's a sequence of hard steps and we can estimate the number of hard steps from our date today relative to when life would no longer think. So that's exactly that duration of a billion years. And that's one of the ways I gives you the estimate. That duration gives you, say, an estimate of, say, four hard steps, whereas the duration from Earth being able to host life in the first life appearing, that would give you a rough estimate of maybe 12 steps. So that's where I gave you the four to 12 steps estimate. That whole model is about only applies to planets where success is rare. <laughs> uh, and of course, it does look like success is rare. Uh, the question is just how rare. So clearly, yes, of course, the fact that we are late in the history of Earth suggests that uh, Advanced life is rare in the sense that it doesn't appear on most planets. <laughs> but that could be, it only appears in one in a thousand planets, or it could be one in a trillion, or it could be one in 10 to the hundred. <laughs> that doesn't tell you which of those numbers it is. <laughs> it just tells you it's, you know, 
certainly as rare as one in a thousand, right? In order to get how much more rare it is, that's the whole rest of the discussion we've been doing. So as I said, if we were not crazy early, then you could think plausibly that we're completely alone. <laughs> that is, everything will just wait for us. If our time were very typical of the distribution, of when life should appear, according to our calculations, then in fact, that would be a completely reasonable thing to say. Well, you know, if there were more of them out there, then we should be appearing earlier. Since we're not appearing earlier, we're probably alone. Right. Right. And so um, my evidence for us not being completely alone, the, you know, is this earliness. And so that's what I would say to Amber, Andrews. I would say, you know, the theory that we are crazy you know, unlikely that it, that is we're almost entirely alone, that they're the nearest other alien civilization is, you know, many, many billions of light years away so far that, you know, light can't, hasn't even got there from here yet. The evidence against that is our earliness. Right. Yeah. So I guess uh, his paper doesn't consider the fact that, uh, I mean, the gra grabby aliens concept where the sort of uh, space could be filled by other sort of uh, expanding aliens and that's why we find ourselves early. I think that concept is not considered by uh, in that uh, I mean, Anders is plenty smart enough and his co-authors to be aware of that possibility. But again, they didn't consider that our earliness is evidence that they're out there. Right, right. Uh, yeah, yeah. I guess it's um, your model builds on top of in some sense uh, what, what uh, his model is about. So th there's been a, a literature on these sorts of questions for a while now. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I'm trying to contribute to that literature, but I am making the claim that in some sense, we kind of know the answer now. <laughs> really? uh, that is, um, in the past, people have sort of had very really broad uncertainty over a very wide range of parameters. And we're saying, well, no, the uncertainty is, is much more narrow than we've thought before because Again, we've got a plausible three parameter model, each of the parameters to within a factor of four. And um, we got to believe the model because of our earliness. Right. I'm curious, how did this change your worldview, if at all, once you arrived at this conclusion? Well, I think it gives us a new sort of living cosmology. <laughs> so the cosmology that we mostly get from astrophysicists today is as of a dead universe, where we are the only exception and that we don't fit very well in the rest of the universe. And now most societies and people in history have had cosmologies. They've had stories about the biggest spaces and the biggest times and what happened there. Most of their cosmologies are living cosmologies. They contain agents with plans and goals and, and choices. And that's motivated people. People have framed their lives in terms of these cosmologies of what the biggest choices were, the biggest agents were, what their goals were, and they've thought in those terms. And we haven't done that so much because our official cosmology of, is of this dead universe where we're the only living creatures. And so it's up to us to do anything we want to, but nobody else constrains us, right? Well, this returns us to a living cosmology. Now we say, well, whatever we do, there are these gravity aliens out there and we roughly know what they're doing and, and where they are and what th their plans are. And we can set our plans and our expectations in that context. So now we have a new living cosmology. We can say one of the key questions our descendants face is, do we want to try to join the elite <laughs> alien civilizations who are right now filling the universe and within a few billion years, we'll fill it all up. If we join them, then we can say interesting things about what will happen then. We will meet them. They will meet us. We will each be learning from the others. We will each wonder who we could get to respect us, who might want to emulate us. We will ask which of them we want to respect and emulate. There will be this community of grabby alien civilizations who meet and then uh, interact. And then eventually, according to modern current cosmology, the universe will separate and they will go their separate ways and become out of contact with each other. But for another hundred billion years, <laughs> they can stay in contact. So there will be this period from say a billion years from now to a hundred billion years from now where all these gravity alien civilizations will be in contact. Uh, maybe they will fight wars. Maybe they will just have parties, maybe learn from each other, who knows? But a big question about us is, will we join them? Will we be one of those? 
Do we want to be one of those? And of course, it comes at a cost. So that's a billion years from now. Can we last a billion years? Do we want to last a billion years? Will we be willing to give up what it takes to be the sort who could last a billion years? Will we be willing to give up our central government and our central coordination in order to allow conflict and competition and even war? Uh, will we be willing to sort of race out into the universe and fat rapidly expand to grab stuff and change it and not respect its original ecological um, conditions? Uh, that's the key choices we face ahead of us. And I think it's motivating to have a cosmology with these active agents in them who right. set choices for us. Right. Um, you, you, you mentioned that uh, in, in a past light cone, uh, it should be very rare for us to see evidence, uh, even if they existed, because they'll be expanding so fast. But do you think with uh, as, as we are sort of improving our technology of scanning the universe, uh, even if it's rare, it should be sort of theoretically possible for us to find some signs of they being out there. Like, especially with, I mean, with the current, say, James Webb telescope so, or so future iterations. In the Grabby Aliens model, uh, if you would see them, they would be huge. So it's not about having, like, good enough telescopes to see really tiny things. They are enormous and huge and not, there's no mistaking them. <laughs> so in that sense, there's not much hope for better telescopes seeing them. Now, again, there are these non-Grabby Aliens at some rate. And so the theory does predict that with good enough telescopes, you can see them. You could see perhaps them during their active phase or the ruins of them afterwards or some artifact they left afterwards. Those are the sort of things you might be able to see from a long distance with good enough telescopes, etc. are the non gravy aliens. And of course, they give you some evidence about the gravy ones. <laughs> You see some distribution over how long they lasted and how big they got before they died, et cetera. And that would, and it, the grabby aliens would be very interested in those. And in some sense, if we don't become grabby and we die, our ruins would sit around and eventually some grabby aliens would pass this point. And once they came upon our ruins, they would be very interested in them because they would be one of the few clues they had about what the actual other grabby aliens would be like. <laughs> that is, until they meet another grabby alien, they don't really know much about the other grabby aliens, but they would learn along the way at least about a few non grabby aliens. <laughs> and they would be trying to guess what grabby aliens are like from the distribution of things they learned about the non grabby ones, probably mostly coming across the ruins of them. Interesting. And so <laughs> if we don't become grabby, our most likely our longest legacy will be grab some grabby alien comes past this way and finds our ruins and maybe we can leave some ruins here for them to ponder on. Right. It's it's interesting uh, to imagine there would be like some Robin Hansen as an alien who's also developing a similar model uh, in, in sort of spirit of becoming a grabby alien civilization. So they would be sort of having the similar knowledge as we have right now. Right. Well, again, that's one of the key parallels here between thinking about aliens and thinking about our future. Yeah. <laughs> Is that... Exactly. You know, it's the same questions and the same story, really. Although it makes you ask, well, how many things about our world and our future are contingent on our particulars here? And how many of them are general that we should expect to see in other places? And those are right. very deep, basic questions for, you know, we have many particular features of our society that we treasure and that we aren't sure are general features of alien civilizations, as opposed to just a random happenstance of our particular past. And that's one of right. the key things we will eventually learn when we eventually meet other civilizations, grabby and not, is how are we weird? <laughs> Great. Um, uh, uh, again, I, I think this has been a really wonderful conversation. Uh, thank you, Robin, uh, for coming here and talking about uh, your model. I will link to the paper uh, and your website also has a couple of very interesting presentations and videos, which I'll also link here. Uh, and Thank you again, and uh, hopefully we'll Thanks, see uh, more and more people realize uh, the idea you have forward, and uh, we'll sort of sort of tease out the consequences going forward. Well, thanks for having me. Okay, bye. Have a great bye. Uh, great weekend. Bye bye.